A quick new idea, daily, from the world's greatest TEDx talks. I'm your host, Atosa Leone, and this is TEDx Shorts. Today is International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. The ongoing tragedy of domestic violence is often considered a women's issue, despite the fact that men are commonly the perpetrators and victims of this violence. How can we begin to shift this trend and better address this pervasive issue? Jackson Katz is an author, filmmaker, and anti-sexism educator who's come up with strategies to get more men to speak up and help prevent these cruel acts. I'm going to share with you a paradigm-shifting perspective on the issues of gender violence, sexual assault, domestic violence, relationship abuse, sexual harassment, sexual abuse of children, that whole range of issues that I'll refer to in shorthand as gender violence issues. They've been seen as women's issues that some good men help out with, but I have a problem with that frame, and I don't accept it. I don't see these as women's issues that some good men help out with. In fact, I'm going to argue that these are men's issues. Calling gender violence, a women's issue, is part of the problem for a number of reasons. The first is that it gives men an excuse not to pay attention, right? A lot of men hear the term women's issues and we tend to tune it out and we think, hey, I'm a guy, that's for the girls or that's for the women. And a lot of men literally don't get beyond the first sentence as a result. It's almost like a chip in our brain is activated and the neural pathways take our attention in a different direction when we hear the term women's issues. This is also true, by the way, of the word gender, because a lot of people hear the word gender and they think it means women. And actually, let me illustrate that confusion by way of analogy. So let's talk for a moment about race. In the US, when we hear the word race, a lot of people think that means African American, Latino, Asian American, Native American. A lot of people, when they hear the word sexual orientation, think it means gay, lesbian, bisexual. In each case, the dominant group doesn't get paid attention to, right? As if white people don't have some sort of racial identity or belong to some racial category or construct, as if heterosexual people don't have a sexual orientation, as if men don't have a gender. This is one of the ways that dominant systems maintain and reproduce themselves, which is to say the dominant group is rarely challenged to even think about its dominance, because that's one of the key characteristics of power and privilege, the ability to go unexamined, lacking introspection, and in fact being rendered invisible in large measure in the discourse about issues that are primarily about us. And this is amazing how this works in domestic and sexual violence, how men have been largely erased from so much of the conversation about a subject that is centrally about men. And I want to share with you this um, exercise that illustrates on the sentence structure level how the way that we think, literally the way that we use language, conspires to keep our attention off of men. It starts with a very basic English sentence. John beat... Mary, that's a good English sentence. John is the subject, beat is the verb, Mary is the object, good sentence. Now we're going to move to the second sentence, which says the same thing in the passive voice. Mary was beaten by John, and now a whole lot has happened in one sentence. We've gone from John beat Mary to Mary was beaten by John. We've shifted our focus in one sentence from John to Mary. And you can see John is very close to the end of the sentence, well, close to dropping off the map of our psychic plane. And now it's all about Mary. We're not even thinking about John. It's totally focused on Mary. Over the past generation, the term we've used synonymous with beaten is battered. So yet we have Mary was battered. And the final sentence in this sequence is Mary is a battered woman. So now Mary's very identity is what was done to her by John in the first instance. But we've demonstrated that John has long ago left the conversation. Now, those of us who work in domestic and sexual violence field know that victim blaming is pervasive in this realm, which is to say blaming the person to whom something was done rather than the person who did it. And we say things like, why do these women go out with these men? Why are they attracted to these men? Why do they keep going back? What was she wearing at that party? What What a stupid thing to do. Why was she drinking with that group of guys in that hotel room? This is victim blaming. And there are numerous reasons for it. And I'm not going to shout down people who ask questions about women, okay? It's a legitimate thing to ask, but let's be clear. Asking questions about Mary is not going to get us anywhere in terms of preventing violence. We have to ask a different set of questions, and you can see where I'm going with this, right? The questions are not about Mary, they're about John. The questions include things like, why does John beat Mary? 
Why is domestic violence still a big problem in the United States and all over the world? What, what's going on? Why do so many men abuse physically, emotionally, and other, verbally in other ways the women and girls and the men and boys that they claim to love? What's going on with men? And then what is the role of the various institutions in our society that are helping to produce abuse of men at pandemic rates? Because this isn't about individual perpetrators. That's a naive way to understanding what is a much deeper and more systematic social problem. You know, the, the, the perpetrators aren't these, you know, monsters who crawl out of the swamp and come into town and do their nasty business and then retreat into the darkness. That's a very naive notion, right? Perpetrators are much more normal than that and every day than that. So the question is, What are, the, what, are, what are we doing here in, in our society and in the world? What are the, what are the roles of the various institutions in helping to produce abuse of men? These are the kind of questions that we need to be asking and the kind of work that we need to be doing. But if we're endlessly focused on what women are do, doing and thinking in relationships or elsewhere, we're not going to get to that piece. One of the things that really bothers me about some of the rhetoric that, uh, against feminists and others who have built the battered women's and, and, domestic and rape crisis movements around the world is that somehow, like I said, that they're anti-male. What about all the young men and boys who have been traumatized by adult men's violence? You know what? The same system that produces men who abuse women produces men who abuse other men. And if we want to talk about male victims, let's talk about male victims. Most male victims of violence are the victims of other men's violence. So that's something that both women and men have in common. We are both victims of men's violence. The heart of it is, instead of seeing men as perpetrators, women as victims, you know, there's a whole spectrum, but instead of seeing it in the binary fashion, we focus on all of us as what we call bystanders. Those of us who are not directly involved in a dyad of abuse, but we are embedded in social, family, work, school, and other peer culture relationships with people who might be in that situation. What do we do? How do we speak up? How do we challenge our friends? How do we support our friends? But how do we not remain silent in the face of abuse? Now, when it comes to men and male culture, the goal is to get men who are not abusive to challenge men who are. It's along a continuum we're trying to get men to interrupt each other. So, for example, if you're a guy and you're in a group of guys, playing poker, talking, hanging out, no women present, and another guy says something sexist or degrading or, 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 or harassing about women, instead of laughing along or pretending you didn't hear it, we need men to say, hey, that's not funny. Well, the bystander approach is trying to give people tools to interrupt that process and to speak up. Now, it's easier said than done because I'm saying it now, but I'm telling you, it's not easy in male culture for guys to challenge each other which is one of the reasons why part of the paradigm shift that has to happen is not just understanding these issues as, as men's issues, but they're also leadership issues for men. Because ultimately, the responsibility for taking a stand on these issues should not fall on the shoulder of little boys or teenage boys in high school or, or college men. It should be on adult men with power. Adult men with power are the ones we need to be holding accountable for being leaders on these issues. Because in a society with, a, with gender diversity and sexual diversity, and racial and ethnic diversity, you make those kind of comments, you're failing at your leadership. There's so many men who care deeply about these issues, but caring deeply is not enough. We need more, we need more men with the guts, with the courage, with the strength, with the moral integrity to break our complicit silence and challenge each other and stand with women, not against them. By the way, we owe it to women, There's no question about it, but we also owe it to our sons. We also owe it to young men who are growing up all over the world in situations where they didn't make the choice to be a man in a culture that tells them that manhood is a certain way. They didn't make the choice. We that have a choice have an opportunity and a responsibility to them as well. I hope that going forward, men and women working together can begin the change and the transformation that'll happen so that future generations won't have the level of tragedy that we deal with on a daily basis. I know we can do it. We can do better. Jackson Katz is the co-founder of Mentors in Violence Prevention, which enlists men in the struggle to prevent men's violence against women. The TEDx talk you just listened to was recorded at a TEDx event in San Francisco, California. All TEDx events are independently organized by volunteers who believe in TED's mission of ideas worth spreading. Special thanks to the organizing team at TEDx FIDI Women. Want to listen to more TEDx Talks? Visit our website at ted.com slash TEDx Shorts. I'm Atosa Leone. Thanks for listening and see you tomorrow.